You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex and Herds here for your Murder Mystery World Tour. We are in our final week discussing Soji Shimada's The Tokyo Zodiac Murders, a classic Mm -hmm. murder mystery by a man who has come to be known as the god of mystery novels, Herds. Flex? (laughs) I don't know. What do you want me to say? What do you want me to say? It's, this is a difficult one to talk about, because <laughs> obviously, and we'll get into this at the end of the show, I'm very chuffed that I was right about many things. Oh, come on. Most things. There are a couple of details you missed, but yeah, we'll there, get into that. There's, yes, there's, there's one, one particularly glaring oh, uh, issue that I'm shocked that you missed, I and I'm a little embarrassed. heartbroken So that we'll, I we'll, it. we'll talk about that when we get the yes. points, but- I just, I don't know how I feel about the end of this novel. You didn't love it with all of your heart? It, it's kind of too golden age for me. Oh, come on. I think the problem is it feels like there's a separation between the puzzle elements and the character elements uh-huh. of this novel uh-huh. that makes sense to me. And I understand analytically why Soji Shimada did, mm-hmm. but it means that it still pales in comparison to the authors that he has inspired who have now managed to sure. integrate those things, such as Keigo Higashino, such as the author who is banned sure. from the show. Who we will never speak about. Never speak of. Never again. Um, never. Future tense. And, you know, it, it's not to say that I dislike this novel. I love this novel. Good. It is ten out of ten. phenomenal. It's just that its flaws are so apparent because Soji Shimada has been so influential mm. that so many people have had the opportunity sure. to improve on what he's done. Yeah. I don't feel like they're flaws to me. I don't look at this and say, oh, look at all these things that are wrong with it. I mean, sure, you could argue that the, the Devotion Suspect X does a better job of intertwining you know, the character of the, the culprit and the, the, the accomplice and all, yeah. that, you know, all that stuff um, in with the actual methodology of the crime itself. But... I don't know. I can set more of an, an evolution than I would like, oh, the, the they were fixing flaws in the design of the story. Yeah. Like, No, no, no. It's, I mean, it's more to say that uh-huh. coming back to this novel with this enormous gravitas to its reputation, I think I overprepared my expectations. I think that's kind of the root of the problem there. I when I when I read this through this for myself, I find it very quaint and I absolutely love the way that the author here closes out the book. I think that um, like, as we say, we, we find out, you know, who the killer is and how they did it. And there's this whole epilogue chapter called the voice of, of Azoth, yes. which is basically just a confession. It is a, a confession letter. One might even call mm-hmm. it. Uh, and from and, the and that's really great because the novel awesome. begins with this letter yes. from the supposed culprit mm-hmm. and ends with the letter from the actual yes. culprit. And it of course is the letter from crazy painter man who wants to create Azoth. And then from the creation Azoth himself mm-hmm. or itself, which is, of course, only created after the, the murder trick yes. or the, the astrological, the magic that has been performed. And the way that Soji Shimada actually you know, lines up um, these two halves of the story to, to create something that's really, really special and different, mm. I think is fantastic, especially if we contrast it with you know, a, a clinically aligned mystery, um, yeah. especially those by Sherlock Holmes, which the story goes out of the way to kind of uh, not necessarily make fun of, but to, to criticize, I suppose. Yeah, and I think I was saying last week on the show that one of the difficulties with this book is that it is so good that critiquing it sounds like I'm really digging into it because I have to be so nitpicky to find anything that I dislike about it. As overall, it's just, it's phenomenally strong. I love the mm-hmm. author's note right before we switch over to, you know, the breakdown scene that we would expect from any murder mystery novel where Soji Shimada concludes by saying, have you figured out which type of magic Taiko Sudo so has used? Yeah, because I mean, the whole point is, and we'll definitely talk more about this in part three, but the whole point is that Kiyoshi is, you know, not, exposing uh, the culprit in such a direct way mm-hmm. um, because they're like respecting them by allowing them to actually come forward and explain everything themselves. And it's, it always kind of ingrained in this idea that the culprit isn't just there to provide us with a mystery. I think the thing that worked especially well for me about that mm. is the way that it frames Koizumi's holiday in a different light because sure. obviously there was that subtext to Koizumi's trip where he's barging in on people's lives and basically asking them if they committed yes, murder which exactly. is just kind of messed up yeah and that as I said last week fell a bit flat for me but mm-hmm. with the delivery of this epilogue it really mm-hmm. hammers home it's kind of the point right that you know it's all about who shows up for the criminal in yeah. the end it's and- who shows up and it like we, we say on the show, you know, that the important things are the who, how, and why yeah. of, like, why the criminal does the crime. But it's also important to, to look at the who, how, and why of the detective. Yes. Like, why are they pursuing the truth and what methods do they use? 
And in the best mystery novels, I feel that characters who are acting rightly and justly and in line with the morals of the story are yeah. rewarded because that's that's just how storytelling works. That's mm. not just murder mystery. That's all stories. But the thing that, uh, that Soji Shimada is pointing out here is that it is important for the detectives in our murder mysteries to be right and just and to be good good people who yeah. deserve to find the truth, right? And it's really interesting how having not felt like a deconstruction the whole way through, this mm. epilogue makes it feel very deconstructed. It does, yeah. And I think that there's something really to be said for how non-clinical a very clinical deconstruction mm -hmm. feels. Mm -hmm. That is an achievement. Yeah. But I, I think the thing that's really interesting to me looking at Koizumi and Kiyoshi as a detective duo is that so often... It's the Watson's perspective being the lens of the normal person into a detective who is just so unfathomably powerful. <laughs> kind of a sociopath a lot of the time, yeah. right? And in this case, neither of them is a sociopath. They're both no. actually kind of on each other's level. They just yeah. have different approaches. Yeah. I do want to bring it back to Act 3, actually, because as much as I make fun of Kazumi for his absolute waste of an Act 3 and <laughs> his, his holiday, like, Kiyoshi doesn't get anywhere either. We just have a waste of a chapter to yeah. show... You know, this 40-year gap really is driving a wedge into the investigation, mm. and we're emphasizing that that gap in time is what's causing the problem, and that gap in perspective, rather than being any specific concrete action from the from the other side of the chessboard. Yeah, it's almost a metaphor in itself for the separation from the detective and the culprit. Yes, it is. Because that's kind of the key piece that has to come together to solve any murder mystery. Mm. And I also particularly like in there that we essentially have the police procedural trick Mm. where they're sat together and they're like, goodness, we can't figure out anything. And then someone says <gasps> something completely yeah, innocuous like, and they just go, the thing, yeah, the like, thing. It's like putting too much air in a balloon. It bursts. Oh, I get it now. We can go and solve the problem. It is the worst Shut crime it. procedural trope, but Soji Shimada earns it with a vengeance here. You're absolutely correct. It is a very simple kind of solution. And I mean, I, I've, we've read the the interview between uh, Sui Shimada and, and Craig Sisseton where he talks yeah. about how there was a very specific uh, real-life case where some trick was played. And that trick is obviously this trick with the bills, right? Yeah. That um, there was probably a, a criminal ring who were, you know, taking 20, 20 $100 bills and stitching yeah. a little bit off and making a 21st. Yeah, it was also really genius of Soji Shimada to tie a case like that to something so mystical and astrological yeah. mm -hmm. because like to think you know the maths problem is like i said last week of cutting up the chocolate or dividing up the bills mm -hmm. and then just to say well what if we just lopped the parts out of people's bodies and Switched stuck them, them back together yeah. like it just it, it immediately clicks in your head because it's so quintessentially murder mystery yeah. but the execution is flawless yeah like the best murder mysteries are ingrained in some some real world yes. kind of fact and reality um, and something that is generally not, mm, in, not reality, but so, so, something that is interesting in in real life. Yes. Like one, one aspect that's in a lot of murder mysteries that we like is how murder actually affects the people involved yeah. in the case who were not killed. Maybe the people who are suspected but are not actually guilty. Well, um, that how just, their lives are affected, you know, that sort of thing. That just drags us back around to the point about the detectives being human, and that's totally exactly the same thing. Your detective has to feel grounded in the same way that your case does. And I think that that's one thing that Soji Ishimada has done an excellent example of making something so un unfathomably far-fetched, but also entirely believable. It makes sense, it's, right? It's such an exquisite balance. Everything just fits. <laughs> All right. Um, it's perfect. Now, Herds, uh -huh. let's wrap up this discussion. Coming up at the yeah. end of the show today, mm -hmm. we are going to be breaking down this crime piece by piece, pun intended. <laughs> this is Flex and Herds. We're discussing the last two acts of Soji Shimada's The Tokyo Zodiac Murders. You're listening to 2SER 107.3. You're listening to Death of the Reader. This is Flex and Herds having a sit-down chat with Associate Professor Rebecca Suda, expert on modern Japanese literature with Sydney University, and particularly has an upcoming talk with the Japan Foundation looking at the history of uh, 1980s and 1990s Japanese literature. And we thought, given that we're covering, covering Soji Shimada's The Tokyo Zodiac Murders, that was the perfect conversation to have. So, Rebecca, welcome to the show. It's so good to have you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So, Rebecca, I, I hear that you're going to be a speaker 
at the upcoming uh, Read Japan talk series uh, with the Japan Foundation on, on March 18th. Could you tell me a bit about why you've jumped at the chance to be a part of this event, Rebecca? Thank you. Well, actually, we had uh, I had jumped at the chance of doing this uh, about a year ago. Um, yeah, and, and so it's part of a, a three-part um, um, lecture series on Japanese literature of so the post-war period so starting from the 60s and then I'm doing the 80s and 90s and then there will be another one also on, on more recent so the new millennium yeah the, the, the idea is sort of to, to give readers so we're talking about primarily works that are translating into English so that anyone can then read the works that we talk about and to yeah just sort of make readers um, familiar with or give a bit more context, give a bit more knowledge about what is Japanese literature um, that is available in, in English translation. Yeah, I mean, we're currently in the middle of a deep dive into Japanese crime fiction here on our show, our home turf. And one thing that we've noticed is how few authors that we'd love to interrogate have been translated into English. How do events like these help bridge that cultural divide when there's, you know, s- such a barrier for some people who, you know, maybe don't know a lick of Japanese? <laughs> yeah, well, I guess one, one thing that they hope to encourage is also for people to start learning Japanese so that they can read the originals. But that's a long journey, I understand. <laughs> but the other thing that I think Japan Foundation tries to do with this is also to, to um, sort of create the ground for more translations to come. So, you know, the, the more works um, become popular with readers, the more publishers are likely to also sponsor the translation of other works. So, so it's kind of a, a sort of virtuous circle, I guess. Yeah. So the novel that we're covering on the show right now, The Tokyo Zodiac Murders by Soji Shimada, spends a lot of time, arguably too much, uh, exploring the sights, sounds, and the romantic history of particularly Kyoto in Japan. Is this sort of indulgent, flourishy writing showing the romance and the beauty of the cities of Japan typical of the 1980s, or was Soji Shimada out on a limb? I mean, so- Unusual, but it's it's interesting in the in the novel because it is not set in Kyoto, right? It has a, a, a part that where they move to to Kyoto, and it's true that probably in literature of the of the 1980s in Japan, you would find a lot more sort of urban, super contemporary settings like like Kyoto, uh, sorry, like Tokyo skyscrapers and and so forth. And I think they're like yeah, so I think. That's meant in the novel maybe to to sound unusual, to seem like sort of the old Japan that would be exotic to Japanese people just as much as it is exotic to um, to foreigners. Kind of harkening back, I guess, to some of the more artistic works that Soji Shimada seems to reference in the way that he frames it in this very kind of painterly style he describes. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I've actually reread the the novel for this. And um, I was thinking about this uh, in particular, the, the, the narrator. The scene that is towards the end, I felt where he is asked by the other guy to go to uh, the, uh, I can't remember what it's called in English, the Street of Philosophers or Philosophers Road. Or yeah, like, yeah, the Philosophers Walk, it's called oh, in the yeah. translation I have. Philosopher Walk, that's right. That's a Tetsuga no Um And he doesn't know what that is. In Kyoto, that's like really famous. Anybody who's been to Kyoto would know what that means. And I think it's it's really done a bit on purpose that you know the, the character is such a um, you know not a Kyoto person that he he finds the name strange and he has to ask for directions and so forth. He has that reaction to I think every landmark in in the city yeah. when they travel over the uh, the bridge the the moon bridge where you can you know see. Uh, if you look down, it's as though the moon is being crossed over by by the bridge. Um, he doesn't know what that is. He he he's familiar with like the Imperial Palace and and the universities, but all of the more romantic and more academic, I guess, sides of Kyoto, the the um, the, the artsy places, I guess you might say, <laughs> he's not really familiar with. And I guess that's partly just to give the audience a good place to insert themselves. But it it really is a strange choice. If if I were in Japan, I'm familiar with the stories of Kyoto and somebody just just doesn't know anything you know they're, they're a country bumpkin <laughs> effectively well but but more than a country bumpkin i think he is a, a contemporary urban japanese person you see so so he would be familiar with you know shibuya crossing but not the you know the temples of kyoto if that makes sense exactly exactly 
Now, I understand, Rebecca, you, you have extensive experience studying met, uh, metafictional texts, in particular the works of, of contemporary Japanese writer uh, Murakami Haruki. Um, now, where do you draw the line, Rebecca, between clever narrative device and a true metafictional uh, text? That's a murder mystery question for the ages. It absolutely is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to challenge you here, see if you can give me a straight answer. <laughs> of course, I can't give you a straight answer. <laughs> <laughs> that would that would be you know that would defeat the 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 point. Um, hmm, hmm. I mean, what I mean, I don't know. What what is your definition of a, of a true <sighs> metafiction? Well, I think approaching it from the murder mystery lens. So much murder mystery references other murder mm-hmm. mystery. There's points in the Tokyo Zodiac murders where they're referring to all of the classic detectives of old. So there's all of this great you know metafictional referential stuff. Um, and I guess that's where I draw that line where the story kind of engages actively with its own genre as opposed to uh, merely referencing its own mm-hmm. genre. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. At the point where, an, where a novel crosses over into, you, if you can get hints as to the solution of the murder mystery by being familiar with specific aspects of the genre, like the names of, of characters um, or a particular story that the novel just keeps referencing over and over, you know? That's when it becomes metafictional to me. That's kind of where I draw the line. Mm-mm-mm. Well, Murakami Haruki is a bit like that as well. There's one example which is quite similar and uh, even a bit sort of uh, bolder or more unnerving of the um, something that is in in, um, in the Tokyo Zodiac murders as well, which is the the thing where at the end the um, the author. Of yeah, the, the author actually in that case there's really the author. Yeah, the author's notes towards the end. Challenges yeah. the reader to solve the mystery because they have all the um, yes the past taunts. <laughs> well, there's a novel by Murakami um, where he kind of did something like that and and then ended up doing something very different, which is he it's um, the Wind Up Bear Chronicle, which in Japanese came out in three volumes, and initially it came out in two volumes and it ends at that point. Um, and in theory, he was going to just leave it at that, so leave the, the the reader with all the clues and not reveal the solution. Not that we would be familiar with any particular text that, that has that twist. But. No, not <laughs> none whatsoever. We're, there's a there's a book we've banned from the show that did much the same thing. Yeah. And the only yeah. reason we've banned it from the show is just because we love it so dearly that we, we don't want to we don't want to fill the show with just referring <laughs> to it. <laughs> Yeah, and I guess the other example that I wanted to I wanted to ask about was you had a book that came out last year, Two World Literature, uh, Kazuo Ishiguro's early novels. And when I was looking up Kazuo Ishiguro, the one thing that really interested me is the way that because he, I guess, began writing after going through uh, school in the UK and kind of started to build that gap of, uh, I guess, texts between Japan and England – had a bunch of really weird stories about him, you know, sending other people to stand in for him at author's events and all those sorts of things. So what are some of the characters in fiction that you've studied that are really worth checking out if people want to get a kind of crash course in uh, Japanese texts of those times? You know, is it uh, Murakami Haruki and Kazuo Ishiguro? Who else should people be looking for? If you're if you're focusing on, on detective fiction, however, I, I, I have two favorites that I would recommend. Um, a little like one started in the in the eighties and it's um, uh, Miyuki Miyabe, and the other is uh, maybe already looked at. I don't know. Is is uh, uh, Natsu Kirino? More fodder for the world tour later this year, Hertz, I suppose. <laughs> Too much. We need to leave Japan at some point, but like I am, <laughs> I am loving my time. It's good, you know, with the koi pond to the cherry blossoms and, and the murder. Uh, it's thoroughly entertaining to me. Alrighty, yeah. well. Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us here on Death of the Reader. It's been a pleasure having you. Thank you very much. If you are curious in checking out Rebecca's talks along with the Japan Foundation, we will have links up on the podcast for that. And it is happening Thursday, the week that we post this. So make sure you get right onto that if you're listening. You're listening to Death of the Reader. We are discussing the Tokyo Zodiac Murders by Soji Shimada. And we'll be back with our last chat on that in just a second. This is Death of the Reader. Flex and Herds here discussing the Tokyo Zodiac Murders by Soji Shimada. Acts 4 and 5 and the epilogue. 
Mm-hmm. My goodness, herds. <laughs> ah, what an intricate crime we've had to, to work with. Can I have just one moment to gloat before what do you we, want before to gloat we about? rip into what I what did could terribly? You, what could you possibly have to gloat about? I was just Such so happy yep. when I got to the diagram of how yes, the bodies yes. had been rearranged. I, can I tell you, when I asked you last week if if you had sort out which body piece was which, I kind of hoped you'd brought in a little piece of paper with a diagram on it. <laughs> that would have been mwah, perfect. But yes, continue. I just had a list of text for it. That, was, okay. that was really great. And I yeah. particularly enjoyed the Hail Mary with the uh, with the handbag. handbag, yeah, that was the one detail that I wasn't gonna put any points on because I thought it was so far fetched. But you nailed it. Congratulations. Yeah, it was one of those things. I was I wasn't particularly confident about it, but I figured that it was the one thing they discussed that was new information as opposed to what we'd had in the previous act. Mm-hmm. Was that mention of the handbag store? So I was okay. like, this is the only thing I have to go off. The other um, the other intermission scene with the police officer was clearly super important. So this must be as well. Sure. So I felt good about that. Mm. But as with this entire crime, I can't take too much credit for it because as we've <laughs> said, I, I kind of knew what we were getting into yeah. from other context of other things I've read. Yeah. I, I do want to say though, I feel like, especially with the sorting of the body parts yes. and the discussion, m- most of the discussion of you know <laughs> the individual actions of the culprit, um, you were pretty much spot on. So I but... think you're, let's let's say <laughs> let's let's start on positive. You're definitely walking away with at least two points today. Um, however, I have one major gripe one with you, and gripe. let's be clear, I. I would have said that your answers to my questions last week, the extra questions I gave you would be enough to make up for this, but I kind of want to put this in your hands because (sighs) you committed maybe the greatest sin of any murder mystery solver I've ever experienced because when I I was so distracted (laughs) by the locked room that I completely missed that the person who did the crime was the Mm. one who found the body. Yeah, That is the most basic yeah. maneuver in yeah. a murder mystery story yeah. and i am that's this is it's, oh. it's not even like I mean, that is bad but also the fact that i i, I kind of baited you into this so i do feel a little bit bad uh-huh. but we, we were talking about how like you know the, the door mechanism's a little complicated I was like well you know you could like use a hook and string to pull that together and you were like yeah let's go with that um <laughs> which is that's uh, the in, game though that's the yeah. game i cannot i cannot yeah, sit like, here if you don't want to give me that point I cannot sit here and argue yeah. it because that's the whole point of the, the two of us being here. The thing is, here. if you had given <laughs> any other solution or even failed to to respond, I, I might have solidly given you that point. Yeah. But you just you decided to go with the, the oldest trick in the book and, in my opinion, one of the worst, which is to thread a piece of string through a window and pull the latch shut. Yeah. In my opinion, when you when you have a solution to a mystery, it should rely on the positions of, of the characters, right? Yeah. It relies on a character being in the room to lock the door or the door not being locked at all, or there's a secret passage, or, you know, these sorts of specific uh, ways of getting around the locked room. Here's the thing that confused me most, though, is that they did bring the rope and string up in the solution. Kiyoshi says, oh, it was probably a hook and string. He doesn't bother, like, explaining it. I I was like, I made the same mistake Mm -hmm. as Kiyoshi, and I just... I don't I don't understand whether Soji Shimada has done some masterful bait and switch in the same way that you did, admittedly, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and managed I mean, to trick me into it. Or I gotta pull the answer. So here's here's my opinion because mm-hmm. we have to get into this. So I think that Kiyoshi has has said this to Kazumi because he doesn't want to. He just doesn't want to think about it anymore. Yeah. It all comes back to what we were talking about. Yeah, and the majority of the solution. And so once he'd figured out, oh, this is how it happened. Oh, this poor lady. Oh, this is awful. I hate this. Uh, he he just didn't want to think about it anymore. That's his kind of reaction. Okay, so that's that's all the points out. I think unless you're feeling really generous, herds, I'm happy to walk away with two points okay. from this. Yeah, I wanted to to chat about it with you because I f- I feel kind of dirty, but I think two points is is more than reasonable for this one. Yeah, and we'll have to see if you can make up for it in the next novel. <laughs> that was good. I I really enjoyed chatting about this one. I I know you had some misgivings and you you know you hated it and all that. <laughs> But I don't oh lie like that. I thoroughly enjoyed this novel. It's I would so good. I would read it again in mm. a heartbeat. It's not that long either. It's it's really not. Let's what else uh, did you want to chat about? I, 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 I kind of wanted to and... go down this list and look a little bit at how the story implements the rules of Knox. Okay, because I think that it's very intelligent. How mm. uh, something we haven't talked about, and I didn't kind of realize until I got to the end, is that the story basically raises the idea of all of Knox's rules indirectly in ways that sure. doesn't actually sound very. Noxian. Mm. The one that particularly stands out is the fifth one that no Chinaman or no odd man must figure into the story. Sure. I really liked how Hitaro factors in on mm. that front because okay. he is the 
character from a foreign love that mm. Heikichi had. So even though he makes sense in being around the sphere of Heikichi, he's still kind of the odd one out. And it's really interesting how Soji Shimada yeah. un- unpacks that and unravels yeah. that, going back to what we were saying about this being deconstructed without feeling yeah. it. Well, it's it's curious that he's the odd one out in being, you know, from a foreign a foreign mother and yeah. also for being the only male uh, child mm-hmm. and thus is, of course, not killed during the murders, which makes him an easy suspect to, to kind of pick out. But, uh, of course, on the other hand, if you actually look into the way that the, uh, particularly the letter emphasizes the different characters, mm-hmm. He's mentioned, but far more emphasis is placed on the actual culprit, yeah. um, which is something that uh, we, we've discussed off air a little bit, um, that th- there is so much emphasis put on, ah, yes, I have this daughter and I'm very very attracted to her because she's she, the looks, best like, looking she one. looks like that mannequin and she's so fly in that new dress that she bought last week from her hospital job <laughs> that I would not know anything, you know. Yeah. Like it, it actually reads a little bit self-indulgent when you know who's actually writing totally. the letter, which is great. <laughs> But, but yeah, like you're absolutely correct in that there are characters who by the tropes um, you would suspect as being the, the prime suspect. Yeah. But if you consider it from the character's perspective, it makes more sense to suspect the actual criminal. Yeah, and that's the other cool. thing, that clue about the hospital I really like. When we look at the eighth rule that the detective must not light on any clues. Mm-hmm. And also uh, when we kind of, I guess it kind of applies to the doubles rule that there must not be twin brothers or doubles generally. Yeah, unless we're prepared for them. And this is something we discussed in the first part. I asked, you know, what's the point in having the murder suspect have a twin mm. if the twin isn't in some way involved yeah. in the murder mystery? And the reason is that it's the, the idea of a double is setting up the whole concept as well as the mannequin. Yeah, of it's a setting up the concept identity. of switched identities um, and of bodies, like because the bodies are being switched with each other. Like it's a very indirect way of foreshadowing the way that the, the six bodies are set up. And as we were just saying, awesome. the fact that the opening note is written by someone pretending to be someone yep. else, it's yeah. so clean it conceptually. It all fits together without being very like, ah, I've heard of a case where <laughs> two bodies were cut in half and they made a third body with the stomach cut out or yeah. whatever. No, I, I wouldn't say that it broke any of the rules. And that's kind of the really clean thing here is that this is a great example of a story that has used all of the rules done them incredibly well Mm. and also kind of poked at the rules in the same way. You know, when we look back at, for example, Naomi Hirahara's Sayonara Slam, Mm. that was a really great novel to read, but it wasn't a particularly good mystery, even though it fit out all of the rules. Mm. And I think- That's because it didn't really like lean on them too hard. Exactly. And and that's the game, isn't it? That's the game at what we like to call in the business a meta level. It's incredibly easy to not break Knox's rules if you're not trying to subvert them or play with them in in a- you know, in an aggressive way, um, and that's that's fine. Novels can do that and still be good stories. Uh, but obviously, Soji Shimada here is drawing attention to murder mysteries. There's a reason beyond just a joke that he directly, you know, references, you know, all of these different, uh, you know, Western detectives. Yeah. And I think he thoroughly uh, excels uh, for the time period that this book was written in, at least, um, against his contemporaries in, in just blowing those expectations out of the water. Well then, Herds. Mm. Flex. We go from yeah. one of the greatest Japanese murder say, mystery novels of all what, time. What are we on? What's What have you got to top the greatest Japanese murder mystery novel or one of at least? <laughs> we are going <laughs> yep. to Masako Togawa's uh-huh. The Master Key. The Master Key. This novel, uh-huh. Herds, will be an interesting challenge for you. It's very different okay. from Soji Shimada. You're scaring me. I was initially <laughs> presented this book as a Honkaku mystery, oh. which is to say play, right? a traditional mystery, traditional. Yeah. Uh, which in Japan is normally alludes to fair play. Sure, at least. Sure, sure. I don't agree. That I'm familiar with. Why, what do you mean? You're giving me a mystery that is not a traditional fair play mystery. And you're going to prove me wrong. I'm going to prove you wrong? That's right, Herds. That's, That's the my game. challenge? I better get like 50 bazillion points for this <laughs> if I could solve them. So you didn't solve this one then. That's uh, what I'm hearing. I solved this one, uh-huh. but it but? it finagles with the rules in a way that I think are oh, no. contentious at best. That doesn't bode well. And we've we've finagled with some some murder mysteries that have tread the line so yep. delicately that we we praise them to the high heavens. Is this going to be one of those, oh, this is mm, this is a problem. You'll just have to wait and I'm see, scared. Herds. I'm we scared. are doing the prologue and then parts one and two okay. of the book next week. I'm very excited for this, Herds. I'm not. I'm scared. You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex and Herds here. This has been Soji Shimada's The Tokyo Zodiac Murders. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you with the master key next week on the show. This is 2SER 107.3.